Uh, I'm Melissa Ford. I'm a PhD student at St. Louis University in American Studies. Um, the title of my presentation changed a little bit from what was uh, I originally gave uh, the BMRC. Uh, so I'd like to take you just uh, real quick through my, my process of narrowing down my topic, um, which was absolutely necessary when you come, with a big question like, how did African American women um, interact with the Communist Party in the 1930s in Chicago? Um, there's a lot of information about this, and um, for every slide and for every sentence I have, I have about 30 more pages of notes. So if you want to talk about that, that's good. Um, um, so I tried to distill it into 15 minutes, but we'll see. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that was my question coming in, and one thing I really wanted to focus on was the Midwest, because all communists, uh, there's been recently been a lot of scholarship focusing on African American women and Communist Party, but it's all been in New York. So one thing I wanted to do was focus on the Midwest, some previous research in St. Louis showed that there was communist agitation in, um, in coordination with uh, African American women in St. Louis. So I was thinking, what about Chicago? Um, and then, of course, focus on race and gender, uh, especially in the Communist Party where historiography has generally ignored it. Um, and it's still very, like I said, up and coming, but there, there are gaps that need to be filled. So then, um, when I did my secondary research on this, trying to figure out what's going on at the time, I came across many, many books that um, have usually about a paragraph about a strike in 1933 in the Sopkin Apron Factory. So my new question then began, um, what were the national and local events leading up to and during the Sopkin strike? Um, and then what did, the, what did this do for African American women and the Communist Party? So in this presentation, I will briefly show you how my uh, research with the Black Metropolis Research Consortium uh, helped contribute to answering these questions. And although I'm far from a complete understanding about uh, this topic, African American women and the Communist Party, um, I hope this will later inform my dissertation and articles as I continue on this road. Uh, my first task was to understand the local conditions of African American women um, and African American labor, especially in the garment industry, considering this is aprons. Aprons are garments. Um, also, the uh, Sopkin factory did house coats. So if I say garment industry or needle trades industry or clothing industry, those are all the same thing. That took me a while to figure out. <laughs> so then my second task was to document the history of this relatively obscure strike. And then lastly, uh, I want to um, tell you about what's in the future and what needs more to be done on this, because I still think there's a lot more out there. And then to show my appreciation for the BMRC, um, I included the archives and locations from which I got all my information. So to begin, uh, the African American women in the garment industry were relatively newcomers. It had been mostly preoccupied or mostly occupied by Jewish tailors, immigrants usually. And uh, so in this, in uh, 1917, African American women, about 500 of them, entered the garment industry as strike breakers. And after the strike was ended, they stayed on. So the history of uh, African American women is, is relatively short considering. Uh, the photos here come from a publication in 1940 by the Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. The Ladies' Garment Workers' Union was a garment union, obviously, um, in ladies' apparel. It was uh, led at this time mostly by Jewish men, although some African American women later came to leadership and prominence in this organization. It was mostly centered out of New York, um, so I did a lot of research on it, but uh, just to inform myself on what's happening in this other area. So, uh, ILGWU was largely uh, it was local and active in Chicago, but uh, not necessarily with African American women. So, but just to give some context, um, Wilford Carcel, who has like the definitive history of ILGWU in Chicago, said that in the spring of 1933, Chicago dressmakers were stirred with signs of approaching revolt. The promise of the New Deal buoyed their confidence. They consequently turned more eagerly to the Union. The dress campaigns became full of life. Now the first strike was organized by the Needles Trades Industrial Workers Union in the South Coast Factory in 19, the first strike in 1933. This was part of uh, the Needles Trade Union, is just what I'm gonna call it for short, because these acronyms get crazy. Um, was part, it was part of communist sponsored uh, league for industrial unions. Now the Communist Party had been very active with um, African Americans in Chicago's South Side. Uh, rent strikes, anti-eviction strikes, um, often the communists would find out where an eviction was taking place, physically stop the movers from taking the furniture out mm -hmm. and move everything back in. Uh, there's often, uh, uh, often uh, communists would threaten local leaders, uh, including Oscar de Priest, who was probably an unfair target for a lot of their, uh, their militancy. And then also internationally, the uh, Scottsboro Nine, which was a case where two African-American, I mean, 
nine African American youth were falsely convicted of raping two white women in Scottsboro, Alabama. Um, and the Communist Party's ILD took over the defense of that and uh, led a huge international campaign that um, really drew a lot of African Americans uh, to the Communist Party, not necessarily as members, but at least to uh, receptive of their ideology. Um, often though this turned out to be very violent, one of the most famous acts uh, was in 1931 where an anti-eviction protest led to bloody conclusions where uh, three African American males were killed as they tried to stop these movers from um, taking out the furniture. And uh, although this uh, sort of quelled this, uh, this uprising, sorry, um, it did, uh, oh sorry, so this uprising did stall um, evictions for the time being. The communists considered it a slight success but then it was a larger success in the uh, essence that the Communist Party was sincere, or at least appeared to be, in helping the African Americans on the South Side. So therefore, with the buzz in the garment industry and then the uh, local communist action in the South Side of Chicago, um, the Needle Trades Union moved in to organize the Sopkin factories, which were mostly noted for their, which were notorious for their starving wages, starvation wages and ill treatment of workers. They were known as the sweatshop, Sopkin sweatshops. Uh, straight wages for those women who were making a salary was $5.95 a week. These workers for $4.5 a week and 10 to 12 hours a day. I know these numbers don't mean a lot um, in terms of inflation, but these were uh, second to Chicago, second to New York in terms of garment workers' wages. New York was the best paying, the South was the worst paying. Um, but African American women were uh, definitely received less of a fair uh, shake of the wages. Uh, African American cutters, which was a skill job to cut the fabric, uh, made five to six dollars a week, whereas white cutters in the Sopkins factory made uh, 15 or 18 dollars a week. Also something to consider, and I do want to put this all in relative terms, because uh, it, in the garment industry, I don't know, but fashion changes very frequently, even in aprons, I guess. Uh, so it depends on the season of the uh, season of the clothing industry, um, and which, which would determine these wages, also determine employment. and. Uh, so that's uh, all things to consider when thinking about wages. But other conditions, I mean, wages were not the only thing. They were a big thing, but uh, there were poor working environments, and, which included uh, included charges for cashing paychecks, inadequate bathroom facilities, and male chauvinism, mostly from the Jewish uh, bosses. So, at 9.30 on June 19th, 1933, 1,500 African-American women walked out of the Sopkin factory. They demanded a 17.5% uh, increase in wages and a nine-hour workday. Mr. Sopkin, though, was unwilling to comply. Now, a little backstory on Mr. Sopkin, because for every strike, there is someone on the other side, and I don't want to um, exalt these women as the, the right ones, and he's the villain. So I was able to do a little research on him. Sopkin was a Jewish Ukrainian immigrant who had worked in the garment, garment industry his entire life. He, uh, was, he worked in sweatshops in New York, then moved to Chicago to establish his own business with his brother, and arose to prominence, and obviously employed a good amount of people. So when he was confronted by these women, he was complete, well, the newspapers uh, revealed his shock. That's at least what he came across as in the Defender. He didn't know why they were striking. He claimed he had been a father to these women for the last 20 years, and he taught them valuable skills. And then he blamed the communists for agitating the employees and threatened to shut down all the factories and move south. Now, for shop employers like Sopkins, the label of communism was enough to undermine the uh, women's demands. Uh, though 1933 was certainly not the Red Scare of the 1950s, or even the Red Scare of the 1940s, there was certainly still a lot of red baby, and communists were considered a threat by moderates and, um, of course, by conservatives. But with the Chicago African American population on the South Side, the communists, like I said earlier, had proven themselves to be very militant in, um, in their efforts and seemingly very sincere. I keep using seemingly because it's very controversial, I don't want to go in there, but uh, to all intents and purposes, communists the African-American uh, population, working African-American uh, population in Southside Chicago was uh, sincere. So the strike continued for two weeks, attracting the attention of police. Uh, the police would break up these strike lines by beating the women. These, uh, these, this violence dominated headlines, as you can see. Um, the women, though, again, trying not to make a one side right and what's I wrong. The women were not altogether innocent. They responded by biting cops, pulling strike papers out of trolleys, breaking windows with bricks and fists, and there was even a report of an elderly woman taking her umbrella to the head of a police officer. 
So these are the headlines. <laughs> uh, so these are the headlines that uh, dominated, and this came to the attention of a professor of English at University of Chicago. His name was Robert Morris Lovett, um, where he was drawn to the scene of about 20 strikers, and he persisted. He confronted the police and persisted in uh, protecting the rights of the women strikers. He was arrested on who knows what charge. Um, was only held for about an hour and then re later released. But this also dominated the headlines that a white upper class, middle upper class professor at an established university would go to a, a strike scene where working class African American women are demanding uh, fair wages and then risk and actually be arrested. This was something that dominated actually national headlines. The New York Times covered it and it uh, has been mentioned uh, very rarely in uh, secondary sources that cover this strike. So uh, even though in the uh, in uh, his personal papers held by the University of Chicago, he denies being a communist and very much separates himself from that label. Uh, the tie to this working class ideology was something that, uh, I, I, don't, I know it's kind of idealistic to say it crossed class boundaries, but uh, at this time, uh, people like uh, Professor Morris, and he even had some help from the local ACLU, um, were crossing these class lines to at least support this higher uh, idea of freedom of speech and right to assemble. So the interracial, interclass, and interface relationships are one of the most compelling things about um, this strike. Claude Lightfoot, a local communist leader who uh, later rose to prominence among the party, described a unique situation uh, in his memoirs held by the uh, History Museum. It's a long quote, but I think it's worth it because it, uh, again, is not something that's mentioned in the short paragraphs um, that talk about the strike. He writes, quote, another event that had great class significance was a strike that took place in Chicago in 1933. A Jewish owner of six shops and textiles employed about 1,500 black women at starvation wages. They were known as the Sopkins Sweatshops. The Fur and Leather Workers Union sent a team of Jewish organizers to Chicago to organize these black women. At the time, this was a rare incident. Jewish workers organizing blacks to oppose Jewish women, Jewish owners. So uh, he has joined uh, attention to this fact that uh, there is this uh, religious aspect, there is this race aspect. Uh, the class aspect is still yet to be developed, and I think there's something there, but um, uh, this is later a theme that will come up from, that is uh, reflected in the papers of Jack Clink, who was a white communist in Chicago. He cited an incident where the police raided a private house meeting where these workers uh, were assembling. Um, and he talks about how they separated the races, but they actually got two guys mixed up. Uh, quote, Gil Green, who had dark kinky hair, but he was white, was put in the room with blacks. Lloyd Brown, who was very light, but African American, was placed with the whites. The police, speaking to the whites, attacked the blacks. Speaking to the blacks, they argued that the whites were trying to misuse them. They were surely experts at harassment. Uh, so you try to use this strategy and attack of separating, uh, putting a wedge in uh, the interracial aspect, mm. separate the communists, um, obviously backfired for a couple of reasons, but um, uh, it also, also underestimated the, this, the solidarity of the communists, at least the communist leaders, because this was a, this was a meeting among the leaders. Um, so while the police tried to use race as a wedge to break up the communists and the strike, Sopkin used the moderate African-American leaders in the Southside community. I mentioned Oscar de Priest before, he was a Republican congressman, uh, who was helped to bring in the strike. He was on the strike settlement committee. Um, Sopkin also employed preachers from local African-American churches to talk to the strikers, to preach to them while they were uh, on the strike line. Uh, but however, the women were often very aware of this, uh, this these tactics to break up their strike. Uh, in the settlement talks with Oscar de Priest, they demanded that James Ford, a local African-American communist, uh, would be had to be present before they, they concluded the talks. Um, as well, Claude Lightfoot, the communist I spoke of earlier, told a story in his autobiography that in the settlement negotiations, the strikers rallied around a Jewish communist who was brought in from New York um, as he denounced De Priest. And the women left the hall with the communists, leaving De Priest by himself at the podium. And uh, Lightfoot again said, I, would never, I never dreamed that I would see an event like that. So this, uh, this uh, juxtaposition of African American women and Jewish uh, workers, communists, uh, is something that's, again, is uh, very important. 
So that ultimately, uh, after two weeks of strike, Sopkins yielded to the strikers' demands, except for recognizing the Needles Trades Union. So essentially, this did not recognize the communist aspect of the strike. This said, okay, all right, ladies, we'll, we'll take your demands, we'll give you better wages, but communism was not a part of this, this was just a strike. Um, because of this, the communists uh, considered this only a partial success, but if you're an African-American woman in the 1930s working in uh, what was considered a sweatshop, this was a great success. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can't be undermined in the communist um, historiography, which often says, this didn't do anything for us, this was, this mm -hmm. just, was just a small chapter. But in fact, it could have been a big chapter. Uh, the Chicago Defender, which was usually a moderate uh, newspaper, uh, defended the women. They wrote an art editorial about the strike, ultimately uh, defending the strikers and their alliance with the communists. Quote, the police are attempting to smokescreen this issue by calling these women communists. Suppose they are. Take some of these same policemen off the payroll for six months and they will be communists too. Mm -hmm. I take uh, this quote as inspiration for my title. Suppose they are communists. <laughs> Uh, what does that do for us? What does that say about these women working uh, in these conditions and deciding to assemble with these these uh, characters and people very much outside of the norms of respectability at the time? Uh, they were not communists. Um, most women, I, I think it was less than 30 of the 1,500 women um, of that day were actually signed up to be communists. And there was a very small communist, uh, African-American communist population in the Chicago uh, party at the time. Uh, so the numbers are minuscule, but suppose they, so the question could be reframed to, suppose they do espouse communist ideas. Um, they were not technically communist, but they were shouting and beating cops for the same reasons that the communists uh, and party headquarters in New York were saying. So I argue ultimately that this acceptance of communism and this uh, expression of communism by the black African American, African -American working women uh, as a legitimate encounter the legitimate counter to unemployment, poverty, etc., provided a space for African American working women to participate in radical union activity uh, while still being respected within their community. And this set the foundation for the many radical African American women that would follow, including Louise Thompson Henderson, Audley Moore, Claudia Jones, and Angela Davis. So the second strike was remarkable in the ways that previous scholarship has largely ignored. Interracial, interclass, interreligious, solidarity shows that this strike was much more than just communist agitation. And to reject it as, as just a communist uh, exercise in the, what they called the Negro question of how to bring African Americans into the party, I think undervalues the efforts of these women and the, the efforts of those who helped them who were not within the, the normal social boundaries. So um, in the future, I would like to look at, unfortunately, this was not the last strike against the Sopkin factory. He did not learn his lesson. Um, <laughs> in 1935, the Ladies Garment Workers Union, led by an African-American woman social worker, Tyra Edwards, uh, came in to help organize these women. Unfortunately, there are not as many records of this. Um, as well, there's a 1937 strike led by the communists. However, it was less accepted and um, less well received. And to understand that, you have to understand communist history, and they don't have three days to tell you about it, so um, that's just another chapter in this very interesting history of Sopkin. Uh, and that brings me to my next one. I really want to learn more about Benjamin Sopkin himself. I've been in contact with his grand nephew, who has done genealogy research, and has been very, very helpful and enlightening about this Jewish immigrant who rose to oppress a couple, uh, couple hundred women. Uh, <laughs> So it's very interesting. And then uh, ultimately, uh, my research wants to aid in the, the question that has plagued historians of the Communist Party for over 100 years. Is there an American communism, or is the Communist Party of the United States just a tool of the Soviet Union? And this is hotly debated, and both sides have their volumes of research. Um, but I hope this could just be a small chapter in expounding what is often cited as uh, this failure of the Communist Party to really um, help out the African Americans in South Chicago. So uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank the Black Metropolis Research Consortium for this absolutely amazing opportunity. This is my first time in Chicago in about 15 years, and it was amazing. Um, I use the University of Chicago uh, extensively. They had amazing resources, resources, including a lot outside of the archives, which um, was great just perusing the stacks 
uh, Chicago Public Library, the Harsh Collection, Roosevelt University, the Dalinoff interviews, which I unfortunately didn't have time to go into in my presentation, but they are fantastic, and then the Chicago History Museum. Uh, so in conclusion, I want to thank uh, Tamar for this. Rick, who um, helped me um, get in touch with Eric Gelman at uh, Roosevelt University, Philip silverstone Sapkin, the uh, grandnephew, and then the very friendly coat check man. <laughs> <laughs> he made it really fun to go there. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yes. Did Sapkin do anything besides own this uh, uh, apron factory? No, and there are actually six factories, but that's all he did. So it wasn't just one. The main one was on uh, Michigan Avenue, but he did have uh, five other locations on the south side. But that was his. Do you, do you know, uh, was it on the corner of, do you know if it was on the corner of 39th Michigan? It was 3900 at Michigan Avenue. That would be on the west side of yeah. so. Is that the building that's still there, or have you been back? Yes, I have gone by it. It's still there, and it's a repository for some archives, I'm not sure. Now that's in the neighborhood of where the Chicago branch of the Urban League is. I'm right. wondering if the Urban League or the NAACP are involved, and also if there's anything in federal surveillance. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, first, the, the Urban League and the NAACP were often regarded as enemies of the working class, if you wanted to come from a communist perspective. And there was a lot of hostility between them. Um, nothing in my research showed any involvement of those particular groups in this particular strike. Um, so I, again, so does lack of evidence mean there wasn't anything? Probably not. They, uh, these people were their neighbors, and I'm sure there was some sort of support there. And then in terms of, well, the University of Illinois at Chicago is doing the papers of the Chicago right. uh, branch of the Urban League. And so I seem like they might have approached other organizations before the communists, but in any event. And then you and have federal about, surveillance. Federal surveillance. Um, the Red Squad, which is um, commonly was is a term for the uh, police mm -hmm. uh, in Chicago, who were surveilling the Communist Party. We recently released their archives in the History Museum. I was unfortunately not able to go to them, but um, and they only had a small collection from the 1930s. So I haven't looked into that too much. Um, if they are surveilling these uh, this population at this time, it's the leaders, um, and I really want to get these on the ground stories, which are very hard to come by. Yes? Was there any um, spillover from the New York Garment District and then the Chicago and then back? Did they have any effect, these strikes have any effect on the unions there? It depends on who you ask. The communists say, well, even though we didn't get our, our demands, this strike was you know, influential to all the other strikes that happened. Now, in 1933, the uh, uh, ILWG the Ladies' Garment Union mm -hmm. um, sponsored a strike in the Northeast where over 60,000 women struck. Mm -hmm. um, did this small strike in Chicago have any influence on that? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But many of the leaders, uh, I spoke about Tyra Edwards, a uh, social worker. She was uh, she was not there at that time, but she was then trained in Chicago or in New York, and then came to Chicago as part of the ILGWU to to organize in Chicago. Cool. So there's certainly at least from New York to Chicago, and there's that's definitely the trend in communist history: is um, train in Chicago or train in New York, and then spread out to the rest of the, uh, the country. I also want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Reed for listening to my blathering. His uh, book was a big part of my uh, beginning research. So, thank you. Dr. Reed, go check. I have another question. Did you get a sense of? Uh, referring to the workers as girls as opposed oh, to yes. women about? They were very rarely women. Mm -hmm. They were girls. A uh, large portion of them, well not large, but a s small portion of them were under 18. Um, child labor mostly at that point, especially in the garment industry, had been eradicated. Um, but they were always girls, whether to the employers, to the, the newspaper writers, um, even to themselves. Um, when trying, There's a few, just a very few um, clips of Speaking of lines that the women shouted at the strikes, and one of them was "Stick with me, girls, and we can't lose." So this was, uh, you know, something they used between themselves. And I think it's definitely a product of the day. So I didn't look too much into that, but there certainly is something there. Yes. Uh, um, I think. Did you mention that uh, approximately a third of the women in the 30s that were involved in the strike were communists? No. Or, 
about 30, 30 of them filled out their cards. Right. right, right. There was not a large uh, retention rate, if you want to say that. Okay. They filled out cards. Is that how you know? Uh, that was reported in one of the communist um, <laughs> okay. publications. So okay. that's just, uh, up to debate. Okay. So. Thank you.